We're going to kick off our series, which this is a five-part interview series that we're calling our Master Trading Interview Series. And this series is all about charting the path from going from a new trader to a pro trader. Um, we got a lot of questions. Every single time we do a master course, we do kind of a lead up to it like this in an interview series. And we take feedback, we get suggestions from people. And this was a much um, requested topic for, for these guys, for our, our educational team, our pros to come out and just kind of chart their path and talk about how they went from just starting out to, to where they're at now, which is um, where a lot of you in the audience want to be. So, so that's what we're going to be doing. If you are new to Sang Lucci and Wall Street Jesus and our whole uh, ecosystem of, of uh, brands here, my name is Charlie Bathgate. I'm the CEO of our operations here. And joining me today is Sang Lucci himself. Say what up, Lucci. How's everybody doing? So Lucci is... The, the founder of Sanglucci.com, obviously, he is uh, the, the originator of basically everything we do here. He, he started all of this, put everything in motion, and he is also the lead instructor for the Sanglucci Master Course, which is the whole reason we're doing this, um, this series. And we are we're starting the next one. The next live session is October 18th. Uh, we're doing one of these a year now which is kind of crazy because we used to do a lot yeah. more of them, but we, we do one a year. So this is, yeah. this is your shot to get in and we will yeah. definitely go into that later in the episode. Um, but we're going to start from the beginning. So we named this episode uh, escaping death by cubicle. And that's because <laughs> we're going to start out Luchi with where you were at. And like, I'm, I'm, this is going to be like origin story stuff, right? So I'm going to ask okay. you to take us back to what is it, like two, that, around 2006 when you yeah. started, like right before you started trading, Te where, where were you at? Where were you working? What were you doing? What was your, what was your yeah. life? Yeah. Um, uh, so I had a job as a financial analyst at a medical company. Um, they uh, made dialysis machines for people with diabetes. And I was just a, I, I was like a, an accountant, you know, debits and I was like, a, it was like staff accounting slash financial analyst. So they had me doing like debits and credits and checking accounts and stuff like that. And then I would do, you know, the month end reporting and stuff like that as well. And that was my, you know, that was, that was my 95. I mean, it was a typical cubicle. It was a typical drive to work every day in the sense of sit in traffic and figure out how best to get to work every day kind of thing. It was, it was come back home and hang out with my, with my then girlfriend and my daughter, which I had, which I just had a year prior. So I had my daughter in 2005 and um, yeah, that was, that was, that was it. That was it right there, man. And that was like the most serious job but that was like kind of, yeah, I guess you could call it the most serious job you had had. You had had a string of like just random ass jobs up to that point. Oh, yeah, had, man. Yeah. I mean, before I was the typical, like I was the typical, you know, I was the typical bad employee. You know what I mean? Like the employee that you just don't want to have. Apologize. I got something in my eye. But the, the, the employee that you just do not want to have at your at your place working. You know, right, right. Like, I think I think you were saying, well, you did like a mall kiosk for a bit, didn't you? Oh, we just lost your video. Which... Yeah, I'm going to put it back on here. I'm okay. Just fix my eye. Would you, uh, would you ask me? You were saying something about, like at some point you were working like a mall kiosk, I think, for a bit. You were working, weren't you at like department stores? You were at like Macy's. You were just yeah. like on a rotation. Um... I yeah I worked at every place at a at a mall prior to that I I I, I would get fired for, well fi before Filene's became Macy's it was Filene's of course so I worked at like three Filene's because I got fired from every single one and then they just never kept good HR records so I just went to the next one down the block and got hired there and you know, I, I worked at a kiosk selling watches and everything. And uh, I worked at a movie theater. 
I worked at an ice cream store, a Spanish restaurant, uh, HMV selling the records, DVDs and stuff, you know, but then always apart from that, like I always had like a side hustle too. Like, of course, as with anybody in high school, you know, you kind of start out selling a little weed here and there. And, uh, you know, things kind of escalate. Then you go legit. And then I'm in college. I'm selling, you know, whatever I can get my hands on. Video games. You know, I was selling porn DVDs because before, like, you know, you couldn't download porn. So you needed to have a DVD and everything. So they would they would entice people to buy porn at the time from the cover art of the, you know, the porn DVD. And I was doing that. Uh Man, I can't even tell. And then I started selling tickets. Then I started selling tickets. Aggressively started selling tickets because that was a very sticky kind of event. And then you really just needed to know the inputs of the game. And, you know, that game got pretty good because I I come from Boston and the Red Sox had just won the pennant. And, you know, you could flip some tickets pretty, pretty, pretty for for pretty good value especially for summer games any summer weekend games we were buying bleacher tickets for twelve dollars and selling them for 80 bucks you know so that escalated pretty quickly and you know i was a young kid with some money in my pocket and and i just couldn't i didn't want to work of course and then i had my daughter and everything changed man as soon as she came everything changed so it was like all right you gotta stop hustling you gotta you gotta go get a job right so i did it for like nine months and then i remember playstation 3 had come out playstation 3 had come out and i had always had a little scheme in the college where i would pay kids to just camp outside of walmart's and i'd give them 300 bucks to, and i'd buy them a tent or whatever and get them food so they could just camp out overnight and secure the spot in line so they could get a playstation so i made like 30 grand that weekend and then i walked into work and my boss was like dude you're late and i'm like what the fuck do you even care like do you like who cares man it's 15 minutes late i do all my work what is the problem you know and he just he just really laid into me that day and i was like i'm i'm leaving i'm leaving you had you had your office space moment and you were like (laughs) my life this is not gonna be my life i'm out (laughs) so all right so then you're in there and whatever i guess you walk out you walk out of the job you're like i'm not this is not gonna be my life and then and then what happens you go how do you end up in the prop firm because to to those who don't know luchi's next step was going to a prop firm yeah yeah i was online i mean i was just online like anybody does when they're looking for jobs um you know, I, I, I was kind of looking for something that was more commission based and something more that I could sink my teeth into, meaning like if I put in X, Y, and Z work, like I know I could, um, you know, what could I get out of it? And during college, like I ran a couple painting businesses, like, uh, you know, I, I, I proved that I could, I proved to myself that I could do some hard work and my father never thought I could. And so, of course, like that was my little crutch to bear because my, you know, you got to prove to your father that, you know, you can, you can, you can, you can do something with your life. Right. So in college, like, you know, I really put a lot of pressure on myself, especially when my daughter came to, to get some things going. And, you know, I I had a good enough belief in myself that I could, I could, I could put something together. Right. And I'm looking online, I'm on Craigslist, I'm on all these sites or whatever. And remember this is 2006. Um, Craigslist was more or less the place to go for everything. Um, so I'm looking at jobs. Most of it was just all bullshit, um, staff, you know, like a lot of it was H a lot of it was, um, recruiting men at that time, like recruiting was so hot. So it was like, it, you know, most of the jobs were like data entry or working as a recruiter or something like that. So I was, I always kind of had an interest in the, in the stock market a little bit. And I found something that just said equities prop trader, commission based only. You know, you get to trade um, the firm's capital. And I walk into this office, and it's it's just thirty. It's like thirty computers. Everybody had two screens and one shared screen in between, in between the desks. So the guy next to you would have a shared screen, and the the screen would have all these filters on it. And again, like it looks like you're level twos all over the place and everything. I didn't know what the hell they were at the time. 
and I walked in, I had an interview and the interview was really nothing. Um, the bathroom was the smelliest, the horrible shit stained bathroom. It was like pop copy from that Chappelle show. You guys remember Chappelle show. And there was that skit for pop copy. Yeah. Um, and one of the dudes in there, they like made 15 grand. And he bought everybody pizza. And I was like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> And I had to, I had to sit down, man. I had to sit down. I had to figure it out. I had to figure it out. So at that moment, I kind of just decided like, all right, I'm going to give this a shot. And, you know, I took a shot. I took a shot. There was a lot of sacrifices that I had to make, of course. And I'm sure we'll get into those in a little bit, but that's how I found it. I literally just kind of walked into it. It was about an hour drive away though, from where I was living at the time. So that was kind of an issue, but whatever I did it. Right. Right. And so that was, I mean, how long did it take you to go from saying like, all right, I'm going to, I'm, you know, I'm just going to kind of fuck around with this and give this a shot to like, yeah, I'm committed. This is what I'm doing. I, and I mean, this is how it, I'm going to make my money. And yeah, I'm, I'm it going. didn't take me long to get committed. I, th- I don't think that was the issue. Like I'm, I'm I just kind of have that personality in the sense where if I feel something and I feel good about something and, you know, I'll just kind of take the shot. Now the path towards profitability though, I mean, that was ugly. That was, that, right. was, that was ugly, you know? Right. And it's, to be honest, it never goes away as even as, even, even if you're 20 years into the business, you right. know, it never really goes away per se, but that first, you know, they, you know, like they always say, you know, the first hundred thousand or the first million is the, is the toughest or whatever. And then everything after that is, is, uh, is all gravy, but you know, you, you have these silly quotes that, that people will talk about, but that first, you know, that path to profitability, the first one, I mean, it's, it's ugly. Obviously I wanted to quit many, many times. And then there was an air in the office because this office had a particular strategy, particular technology. And once that technology and that strategy stopped working and nobody in the, nobody in the office stayed alive, you know what I mean? So there was a lot of turnover at the office. There was a lot of, you know, it, it was just a kind of a new world and, and it takes a while to get adjusted to that kind of, you know, that kind of pressure and that kind of compensation schedule, so to speak. Right. Compensation schedule, meaning you get paid nothing until meaning, you actually yeah, make money. Yeah. yeah like yeah, unlike remember, every other job. Yeah. Remember there's a lot of parts to this, right? So what do you have to sacrifice in order to be able to, to make the decision, right? So you starting out as a trader, and I'm talking to you, y'all folks here. It's like, what do you have to sacrifice, right? And if you're not going to have any income, well, then that's step number one, right? Who do you have to talk to to tell that, hey, I'm not going to have any fucking income coming <laughs> for the next whatever. What are we going to do? Do you have to believe me, right? Because you got to depend on other people. Some of you guys can't depend on other people. And, you know, that kind of frames your decisions as well. So a lot of folks, have that kind of issue where they can't depend on certain people and they can't afford to not get paid and hence why you know you get that sort of turnover so i had to go to some friends of mine i had to go to my family of course i had to go to my daughter's mother of course you know and kind of let them know like okay this is what i'm gonna do this is what i need you know luckily one of my friends let me stay with him without paying rent um my daughter's mother at the time she was okay with it you know, so I had, you know, I had some support. I had some yeah. support. You had buy-in from, from the people you needed to have buy-in from. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And so then you're, I mean, and you knew up from, from your sort of hustles up to that point that you needed to have some kind of edge, right? Like, and it was that, were you, was it pretty much right off the bat? You were like, it's tape because guys in the, in the, in, on, in the prop firm were reading tape and you're like, this is it. I got to learn this. Or how did that come about? Yeah, that was their, well, it wasn't their edge per se. It was their world in the sense that tape, tape was what they watched to inform their decisions all the time. But yeah. the technology that they had was a, was a tool called, um, um, I forget what they call it. They call it so many different things back before 2007, but right. basically it was a way to bypass the uptick rule. So they called it, they called it the product, right? So you would hit the, you, we would set up hotkeys and you would hit this key and it would, it would allow you to bypass the uptick rule and sell on the bid. Okay. So for anybody who doesn't know what the uptick rule is, go ahead and research it, do what you got to do. Uh, you'll find plenty of 
uh, material out there on it. But basically, like in order to short a stock in a, in a, in an issue that had the uptick rule attached, you have to sit on the offer one cent above the offer, or sorry, above the bid, in order to get filled. Like you have to get filled. Somebody has to buy you out, otherwise you can't get short, right? And you, most of you guys know, all you got to do to get short now is fucking hit a bit, right? Before you couldn't do that. Now imagine a world in small cap names that don't have that much liquidity where you could force a stock down because you and your office of freaking junkies are the only ones that have access to this tool, right? So you can beat a stock down a point, two points, and you can step a short down and then cover right into the short. I know it's kind of, it's, it's a language here that you guys might not understand, but that was the technology that they had at the prop firm that everybody used. Now you had to pay out the ass for this tool. So your commissions were super high. So I saw guys that were making, you know, that would make 15,000 in a day, but they would only take home like six, six or five out of Jesus. that because the commissions were so freaking high. And that was the business model for the prop firms back in the day, because they were making money off the commissions and commissions were still high at that point. We ain't, there was no freaking Robin hoods where you, you, you know, you ain't got to pay shit for commissions and everything. And, and payment for order flow hadn't even started until 2007 when regulation NMS rolled out and it allowed for all these things to kind of happen. And then exchanges went to a for-profit uh, enterprise instead of non-for-profit. And again, I'm kind of all over the place here, but, um, you know, that was the technology that they had to make money. So, so to, keep it, to keep it succinct, 99% of the trades that they made were short side trades. We're short, right. we're short based trades. That's it. And, and, and in order to use the product, essentially you're yep. saying you had to have yep. an understanding of tape. Like you had to have an understanding yeah. of oh, market, the way absolutely. the market worked. Absolutely. Yeah. You had right. to have an understanding of what a bid and an, and an offer was. And you had to have an understanding of, hey, when you have a giant short or when you have a giant bid or when you have demand, what does it look like on the tape? Because again, the tape is just a reflection of everybody that's buying and selling. So if you have more demand, what what is what does your tape look like? If you have more supply, what does your tape look like? What can you predict? What can you extrapolate off the things that you're gathering through, you know, the time of sales and your tape? So everything was based off of transactions and and quotes. That's it. Everything. Right, right. So then were you when you were using the product and you, you were trading like that, I mean, were you learning tape? at the depth that you learned it because you were saying were, were you just curious you were like hey this thing might go away and i need to have i need to understand no, no, how all this shit I works just, no i learned it because that's what everybody everybody at the office that was that was these guys who who ran the office they came from that background as well um you know so they had never they weren't even it. really helping you that much right I mean, no you were like, no there was no education there was really no education there was nothing you know, there was there was none of that stuff there. It was just like you come in with a group, you come in with a group of people that are at your level, meaning they've never traded anything before. And right. and, you know, the head traders will kind of come and tell you, hey, take a look at this, take a look at this, take a look at this, you know, but you're out there on your own, man. So I I didn't know what the hell a bid and ask was for six months. man. I didn't understand <laughs> it for for months. I had no idea. So what like what kept you? What kept you going in those early, in those I early saw months? It. You see it. You see it. The thing is, and, and that's like everybody here too. It's like you see the money, and that's the problem. That's the, that's the problem. It's the same thing with with uh, you know any other market, right? You look at the crypto stuff. You look at you look at any markets, tickets, this, that, whatever you do. Like you see the money, and when you see the money, you know it's there. You you see other people that are able to do it. You you start to compare yourself to them as well, and you know you start to believe that you can do this as well, and you can grab some of that money. And that's 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 it. That's it. That's all you need. That's so all that you guy, need. that guy who bought pizza for the whole office is the equivalent of some dude on Twitter who's like, I literally just made yeah. twenty five grand, and you're yeah. like, if this if this guy can do it, I can do it. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent, absolutely, but, absolutely. And that same guy, law, that same guy you know, couldn't, never made it, you know, that same guy never made it, you know, what, after I spoke to him years later, you know, and there, like I said, it doesn't matter if you had a, a, a couple good years, it doesn't matter if you had a period in time where you were just killing it, if you can't 
continually adapt and can't continually support yourself with this game and can't make smart decisions as far as money, you know, and protecting yourself from, from bad periods as well. You know, this, this longevity is a difficult thing for, for traders. Right. Right. So, so then what was there a point for you where you were like, I think I got this. Like there had to have been an initial moment where you were like, okay, I'm getting some traction. Something just oh, happened. Yeah. Maybe it's your first winning trade or maybe it's your first whatever five figure I, trade. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't really a couple trades per se. Like I I finally got to the point where I was always, you know, making good trades, making bad trades, you know, but there was one month where I think I made like five grand. And I think it was like six months in. And, you know, after that, after that month, you know, I, I knew I could do it. I knew I could do it, but then I started going inward in the sense of it was like okay you can do it but how come you're not there and then mm -hmm. and then it was always answering that question like all right if you can do it why are you not there yet and what is you know what is the thing that's holding you back so to speak and for me it was always like the the desire for more and the mental aspect of the game and the psychological aspect of the game that was all, that was always what it was for me so at some point i was like all right i can do this but Ah, there's something wrong here. There's something, there's something still wrong here. I mean, did any, did you have anybody to help you work through those things and answer no, those questions? No, back then? Or is this you solo? No. In the office, in the office, nobody ever talked about any of that shit. You know, I mean, yes and no. Like we were taught not to, or we were told at least by some of the head traders that to never read books on strategy. We were always told to read books on psychology. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the first books that I read in the, in the, you know, this, in the trading world, so to speak, was trading in the zone by Mark Douglas, which is something that's read by every single trader, even to this day. Yeah. And it was just, you know, it was just basics of ment you know, the, the mentality that you need to have if you're going to go into this game. Right. So you had some concepts, you had some things to play with and to, to yeah. root yourself in, but you were yeah. still on your own, on charting own. your own path, like yeah. just yep. muscling yep. your way through it. Yep. I mean, at, at night, at night, I started to print out every single trade that all the head traders were making. And, and they would, they would, everybody would make like 100, 200 trades a day. And I would look through every single trade. I'd look at the history of the of the time and sales, the tape. I'd look at when they got in. I'd look at when they got out. I'd look at everything in between and be like, okay, why did this person get in here? What did they see? What are they looking for? Why did they get out here? You know, and and I did that six months straight every single night. And I didn't leave until like 10 o'clock at night. So I yeah. would get there. I would get there at like seven o'clock in the morning and I wouldn't leave till 10 o'clock at night. I, you know, I wanted, I'm glad you said that because I wanted to give people a sense of like the sacrifices that you were making. I mean, you essentially told everybody in your life, this is, this is going to be my life. This is what I'm going to be doing. And every single day it was like seven to 10, at, you know, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. And you were just grinding for like six months straight. Right. Yeah. 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 And it was, it's, it's a lot of sacrifice, you know, and, you know, most people are going to look at you and be like, you're, you're freaking crazy. And, you know, you, you're not going to make it and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, all, on the one side, it's true. But on the other side, it's, it's not true. And eventually your actions dictate what sides you, you, you end up on, you know, so if you, if you believe that it's that is that you can't make it, of course, that's what's going to end up happening. So Right. You, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta find that point where you, you, you believe I are, I have already kind of had that belief in myself and, you know, I knew that the corporate way kind of just wasn't the right one for me. And there was a couple of jobs that actually I, I applied to that um, I didn't end up getting. It was like, I think one of them was like a management consulting job at, um, at some big firm, some big firm, I think it was Syntas or something like that. They sell supplies, some shit like that. And, um, and you know, I, I started to look at the people that were my peers, so to speak, in that company. And I started to look at their, their sort of growth and track record and all that kind of stuff. And I was just like, this is not, this is, this is not where I fit. This is not where I belong. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just the trailblazing kind of guy and I do things kind of my way and I, I, I learned the hard way too. So I'm kind of stubborn in, in, in that sense as well. So, you know, I, I needed something to sink my teeth into and trading was it. Now, 
you know, regardless if you believe yourself as much as I did, it doesn't mean that <laughs> it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that um, you know you're not gonna have a you're gonna have an easy way of it. You know what I mean? Like it was extremely hard, and there was so many times I wanted to quit, and you know, I'm surprised I didn't. I'm surprised I didn't. And even after that, there were still several times I wanted to quit too, you know, even five years into it, 10 years into it, you know? So, but now it's different. The whole frame of thinking is, is completely different, but that's what it was coming up, man. And in, in that, in that year and a half, you know, you're young and everything and, and you're there with your peers as well, who are as, as young as you trying to figure it out. And nothing much has changed though, but in the sense of being young and starting out like that, I still get DMs. We still get DMs all all day from 18 year olds, 17 year olds who are talking about, you know, I hate school, I hate this, I hate that. I want to, I want to do things, you know, I want to do things, you know, I want to start trading and all that kind of stuff. And and they're starting even younger now, man. And I'll I'll read some of these DMs and hypocritically I'll be like, dude, go back to fucking school. And you know, meanwhile that was the same path that I that I chose as well. So, you know, it's it's the same. It really is the same. And a lot of you guys might be thinking right now, too, that, OK, I had the prop trading experience, but I kind of had all the experiences. So even after prop trading and after prop trading died and I made all this money and then I lost all this money and I had to start again, like I started where you guys started sitting at your house on your phones, on your laptops, doing it by yourself with a small account, five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. You know, I started there again. You know, I had to start there again after after losing my ass, you know, the first time. So, you know, I've, I've started and stopped in all the same ways that everybody, that all of you guys have, you know, many times, multiple times through my career. So, you know, although you guys may, may sit there and think, okay, he had the prop trading, you know, to start off at it's, it's, yeah, I've had it all. I literally had it all where, you know, you're just kind of trying to find a strategy that works for you. And you're listening to everybody else or you're sitting there reading Twitter, what everybody else is doing. And, and, you know, you're just kind of scrambling to try to make ends meet. You know, I've done it all, man. And well, it's, well, it's a good amount of sacrifice. Well, plus in those days, you know, prop firms, like a lot of them were, were essentially predatory, right? I mean, it, it's not like you were yeah. in some room with a, with a group of people who were invested in your success or something like that. I mean, they, they wanted you to churn volume. And that was it, right? I mean, yeah. that's that yeah, was the that's game. What they so. became, yeah, they became that, and then it just became very predatory. So what Charlie's talking about is basically like they'll choose and select strategies that require a heavy volume of trading, right? So one of the strategies that evolved after the um, product got thrown away and the uptick rule got scrapped. By the way, the uptick rule got scrapped in 2007. And at that moment, like I was at the office for maybe a year and a half at that point. At that moment, the, the office stayed open for maybe another year. Maybe another year it stayed open and then it shut down. It shut down. The, the you know, the head trader was like, nah, 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 we're never going to shut down. And then the next day, the fucking door was closed. You know why? Because everybody left and nobody could make money anymore. And then it was literally me and one other guy that, you know, were able to still make money because we learned how to go along. We were the ones that just learned how to fucking go along the stock. You know, yeah, because these yeah. guys were such short based traders and they depended on that technology, which you can extrapolate that out to all your strategies. Right. You have a strategy that's working right now, let's say, and all of a sudden it doesn't work and you're still you're still trying to hammer the nail on the head with that strategy. You're going to blow up. You know, it just is what it is. So we kind of saw I, I saw that writing on the wall coming and I was like, all right, I got to come up with something else. You know, I got to learn some other strategy. So that's kind of how it went down. Right. So, I mean, speaking of like learning other strategies, when you look at your yourself now where you're at and you're looking back on your career, like are there, you know, what, what are the pieces that you identify of your trading sort of arsenal that you say, this is what really has enabled me to be, quote, a professional trader, meaning to make my make my living off of trading to do it at the level that you're doing it at? It's tape. It's always tape. It's always tape. It's never anything else. It's, it's, right. never, it's never anything else than tape. And then the mindset. It's never anything else but that. Right. Always that. Not options? Um, options, no. No, not at all. Because you don't have to trade options at all to, to, to get there. You know? Yeah. You, don't yeah. have to, you don't have to be in that place. So 
it's not options. It was all tape and and mindset, man. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's were there it. other were there other people either kind of when you were coming up or again from this vantage point for maybe like later in your career or you know when we were in New York and stuff like that, other trainers that you looked at that you were saying this, you know, this guy or this woman has you know, has the kind of um style or has something that I want to emulate and you kind of watch them or we cuz you're so you're so independent that maybe for you, you were like, yeah, no, nah, no, nah, nah. there was never anybody. There was never anybody there that because I would always look at them and be like, yo, why are you why are you doing that? We could be doing this. We could be doing that. Yo, I was I was doing my own strategies on the side and the head traders would be like, yo, don't do those strategies and don't tell anybody about them because it was kind of creating an energy in there where some other traders would be second guessing the shit that the prop trader was doing, the shit that the, the firm was doing. So they didn't even want me trading outside of my account in the prop trading office you know what i mean in the in the they didn't want me trading on the side because i was doing swing trading i was doing options i was doing all kinds of stuff so they didn't even want me doing that because other people would find out and then blah 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 it would it would mess up with the company or something like that so right. you know that was kind of unfortunate that was also what made me want to 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 leave as well because once you tell me i can't do something uh, come on man come on Right. Like any, like any trader. Right. Um, so right. what, okay. So then you had, you know, you kind of, in your, in your journey, you kind of took us up to the point, the prop firm folds at that point, you had become consistently profitable, right? You were making money on a, on yeah. a consistent basis. Yeah, and then you went out money. and then you went out based entirely on your own. Right. And yeah. so tell us a little bit about how that unfolded. You, that is that when you started, that was yeah. pre city group trade. But. Yeah, remember, like, life all comes down to, you know, this is to, to quote Bud Fox in Wall Street with uh, <laughs> when he was about to meet Gordon Gecko for the first time, you know, this was the biggest meeting of his life, right? He looked in the mirror and he was like, well, life all comes down to, you know, just a few moments. And um, the market was crashing at that time, 2008, market was just dying. And I was just, you could just hit a button, short something and end up the day up 50 grand, 100 grand. You know, but I always knew sitting there with the with the limitations that the prop firm puts on you, because remember, a prop firm requires that you have limitations on max positions, on max losses, on max, you know, max whatever the hell, you know, and once you get out of pocket and you start, you know, your fluctuations your p l fluctuations start going a little crazy, they're right there to be like, all right, we're moving you back down to 100 share lots from, let's say, 20,000 or 10,000. So if you have a bad month, they got to watch their risk. And now it's a much more automated, you know? So before it was still manually done, you know, the head traders would be like, yo, you got to calm the fuck down. Now it's just automated. They'll just cut you right the fuck off. You know, they'll just cut you right off. So let's say you start with 50 grand, you get down to 5,000. That's it. You cut off. Like you can't do shit else, you know? So they won't really mess with the nuances of the game. They'll just shut you off, you know? So back then you still could get a little leg, you know, because you were a good trader, somebody could depend on you like, all right, he's good for it. I'll, I'll, I'll float him a little bit. So you still have to play that game. That was the game that I was playing in the, in the, in the prop firm. And I was always capped, man. I was always capped. And you know me, man, you can't cap me. You can't tell me that you got me, you got me capped over here, you know? So that never sat well with me. And I knew when I was watching that crash, I knew I was like, this, this, there's millions of dollars to be made here. And what the fuck am I doing? You know, what, what, what am I, what am I doing about it? And so that was when I was just like, all right, that's it, man. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta build a strategy that I know can work for me because based on what I was seeing. And that's when I really just kind of went off on my own and, and started swing trading and started really trading more options. And that's when I left the firm and, and, you know, luckily it was the right moment in time, of course, to really make some big bets, um, you know, at the bottom of the market, so to speak. And yeah, man, that's it. That's the rest it. is history. Rest I is mean, history. Was, was that, was that freaky for you to kind of leave like the mothership of the prop firm and just be like, all right, I'm going to go out nah, on my own now. No, nah, no. Nah. At that point I was just like, all right. Cause I had already wanted to leave for like three, four months. That place was just already, nobody was making money. And nobody could, you know, and you would slowly just kind of see people not taking it seriously and, 
and and working their way out and going to find other jobs and things like that. So I was just like, all right, I got to get the hell out of here anyway. And so when they right. closed that door and I showed up and the door was locked, I was like, perfect. I know exactly what I got to do. Right. Word. Yeah. Well, so paraphrasing it, it's, it's, you know, we, we got a bunch of people who just kind of come in and we're getting questions, you know, how can I watch this? It's all recorded. It's all on our YouTube channel. Go to YouTube, search saying Lucci, you know, you, you'll see this. Um, but you, had obviously this anti-authoritarian sort of bent to you. You were like, I'm not, I'm not going to go work in some corporate world. This is not for me. So you knew that that was going to be part of your path. You had a lot of belief in yourself and yeah. your ability to figure things out and make your way. You, um, you obviously made a lot of sacrifices in personal life, your finances, yeah. a shitload of hard work and dedication, especially right off the bat. And you made some hard decisions in, in, in making bets on yourself at strategic moments where you were just like, yep. Hey, this is what I need to do to make it. This isn't going to be easy, but I'm going to do it. Yep. 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 Absolutely. That's exactly the path there. Or, um, y'all, if you were, I'm seeing a bunch of questions come up in the chat. So put them in the Q and a section, um, because it'll help me sort them. So I know you guys got a bunch of questions you want to ask Lucci and, and we're going to get to those. We're going to get to those actually, uh, actually right now. Um, so throw those in there. I'm going to give us a quick um, rundown of the master course. Again, this is why we're we're doing this. We're the the next master course starts on October 18th. Um, and when Lucci's sitting here talking about the educational experience, the prop firm experience that he had, um, the educational experience was basically non-existent. And what we've done, we've been teaching the master course for I don't know what, five years, Lucci, now? And it has... I think it's longer than that, man. Yeah. yeah. And it's evolved significantly since then. And uh, yeah. it used to be just Lucci teaching like 10 yeah. classes, like a couple on tape, a couple on options. Now you're essentially getting 23 classes. And I know it says 16 there. I'll kind of explain the rest of it. Um, and it's not just Lucci. It's it's Lucci. It's Ron Friedman from Trading the Post, who I'm going to interview later in the series. It's Chris Cady, who I'm interviewing next week, next Tuesday. It's Wall Street Jesus. And basically what we've done is we've tried to shorten your, your learning curve as much as possible. Imagine, you know, walking into a prop firm and you got the four top traders at the firm, you know, right. in their sort of corner offices who you usually right. wouldn't be able to go knock on the door and ask them questions. We'll bring them into a room for you, right? And you're going to learn directly from them in a structured environment. Um, and, you know, you're going to learn tape directly from Lucci. And I think, I mean, Lucci, you can say it yourself, but you weren't getting uh, you weren't getting a curriculum of how to read tape when you were learning. No, That's no, for sure. No, it was literally just, it was just, here's my level two, watch Bid and Ask, watch Bid and Ask for eight hours a day. Well, actually, even longer than that, because I read it. I even read it at the end of the day. So after I would go back in the history and I just read it. I just sit there and read it just like people read code. You know, those folks who, who understand react and freaking JS node and all these other languages, they can sit there and read. Or when you, when you, when you, you remember the matrix, man, dude sitting in front of the matrix and Neo was like, is that the matrix right there? And he's like, yeah, what do you, how do you read it? And he was like, the dude, I think it was Cypher. It was the first Matrix. Cypher was like, oh, I don't even read this. Now I just see blonde, brunette, da 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 da, da you know, but right. he could tell right. what he needed to see out of the code, right? So, right. So that's that's all it is. It's just another language here that you that you need to learn how to read, or you know, that I've taught myself how to read just by sitting there and, and looking at it. And then when you when you truly understand it from a structural level, then you can start making some interesting moves here because you understand behavior you understand who's involved in these things and you understand where people are squeezed and where people are in pain and when you understand those raw emotions and how they reflect on the tape that's where the real money is made that's always where the real money is made i don't care and what that, anybody says that's that's it that's all of it and i think that's one of the things in this series that we're going to be teasing out you know what separates a pro from you know from from somebody who's new or maybe someone who's intermediate um, it's having this deep comprehensive fundamental understanding of how of market dynamics of how market participants engage interact and play off one another and that's something we're going to be talking about in the last interview in this series with Lucci will be coming back, um, back around. And I guess that'll be four weeks from now. So, um, so, you know, finishing up our, my pitch on the master course, basically there's nowhere else in the world that you can learn tape reading options, market structure, trading psychology, 
flow trading um, for, for, for three grand. There's just no way you can do it. Um, if you find somewhere else, I would, I would, I would, we would love to know about it. So, um, you can learn more about it. You can go through our three FT playbook if you want, or you can literally just go to www.sangluchi.com forward slash MC, and it'll take you right to the page. And, um, we're offering a special right now. So we're, we're kicking, we're taking 500 bucks off of the price of the course. Um, if you sign up before October 1st. Um, the course doesn't start until October 18th, but we often see a lot of people sit around and wait until uh, you know October 17th, which puts a lot of pressure on our team to get everybody set up. Um, it's kind of a, a, a mad hustle, a mad, a mad uh, dash to, to, to get everybody set up. We like to have people come in, get early, get set up early. So 500 bucks off if you sign up before October 1st. Um, the coupon code, which I'll put in the chat is sept 2021 500 like september 2021 500 uh again if you sign up before october 1st and as an added incentive when you sign up for the master course you get um two months free in the steam room so but we will start right when you sign up we'll start your your free access additional free access at no extra charge so um you can you basically just tack on another month if you were to sign up today you get a, uh, more than a month of, of free access to the steam room really helps you kind of get your bearings of what's going on and see how a lot of people who've taken the course are using this information. So um, hit us up on uh, contact at if you have questions, or you can use this, this uh, help chat in any in the bottom right corner of any of our websites. We'll get your questions answered for you. And without uh, further ado from that, let's go into some questions for the Q&A. I know you guys got a lot. So let's see here. Luch, I don't know if you're looking at something you want to hit. I'm, but... I'm looking at all of them and I'm kind of like laughing under my breath because, you know, when 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 traders who are starting out are asking certain questions, like you can you can feel the emotion straight from the question that they're asking, you know? Right, right. It's kind of fun. Yep. Um, yeah, you. I mean, guys, we can tell based off the questions you're asking, whether you've been doing this for two months, whether you've been doing this for a couple of years, you know, whether you've been through a little pain or whether you're just getting used to it. So um, this one looks like a pretty good one. Let me read this for a sec. Uh, all right. So basically, this question is from from Marcus. He's asking, you know, was there ever an aha moment, you know, a time when you finally felt that stuff was starting to click, you know, or did your knowledge and confidence just build gradually? Uh, I mean, you know, it depends. It depends on the mood or the, you know, the mood I'm in to, uh, to answer this one. There was, there was definitely a couple aha moments. There, there was several aha moments in reality, but, you know, unfortunately the aha moments will, will further enforce your, or further, you know, uh, solidify your belief in yourself. That's what the aha moment will do, you know, but the aha moments won't last a lot in in the markets in the sense that markets always change you know what i mean and you still have to you still have to keep doing the work it's just like it's just like changing habits and and spirituality which everybody is talking about now like you know you can go take ayahuasca and people will be like okay that's that's the solution and then they'll come back home and they'll be like well shit <laughs> you know the world will just drag you right back down to that same energy you were before you, before you went in there, you know? So the same thing happens in the market. Like you still have to, you still got to do the work. So I've had plenty of aha moments and there was plenty. I still have aha moments. I still have aha moments because remember what an aha moment is, right? Like you're looking for, you're sitting there looking for your moment, right? Your timing, because most of this is, is all timing, right? So you're sitting there just throwing shit at the wall, waiting for something to stick. All of a sudden, something finally sticks. And you're like, okay, I like this. I like this. This is what I'm, you know, this is what I'm good at. And, and then you can, and then it starts narrowing down your focus. But even when you narrow down your focus, you got to keep narrowing. You got to keep narrowing. You got to keep narrowing. So aha moments are always going to happen. So I would say it's more of a, I would say it's more of a gradual thing. There is, and I know what I know why you're asking this, right? You're waiting to see if there's this point in which your mental struggle right now and your suffering right now is going to stop. Let me tell you right now, it's just going to change, bro. It never stops. It's never going to stop. It will never so. stop. So, you know, 
take all the aha moments in you want because every single aha moment is going to be a better one than the last and you're going to be further on in your path than where you were before but the path never ends until you choose to stop you know until you choose to stop the shit ain't gonna end man so look at it as a gradual thing look at it as a constant up and down a constant struggle while you're in this game trying to achieve whatever it is that you're trying to achieve it ain't going to be a straight line gradual whatever you know that's not what it's going to look like and i think what you inherently said in that too is that like you're always learning i think that's one of the things that differentiates you that's the same thing with ranch that's the same thing with chris that same thing with with wall street jesus like the the what separates the quote pros from from non from people who can't you know quite make that or, or just do it as a hobby is that you know that it never ends you're always learning something new you're always hungry for something new um, you know, it's not like, all right, once I learn this, I'm done. And I'm good. For, I'm not for anybody, for anybody, I would recommend you just come to this office, come to this office, and then you'll see what it means for this shit never ends. And it's always changing. Like on my right, I have, a, a, a one of my guys who runs a $4 million hedge fund strategy, which, which just does options writing. Uh, on my left, I got a bot trader. I got a, a sniping bot trader who, who literally just looks at lines of code all fucking day and waits for new coins to drop so that he's able to get them first before anybody else. And then they get pumped up and he sells them right to them. So all he does is bot shit. He doesn't give a fuck about what those coins are, what those companies are or whatever to the next of him. There's a 20 year old kid who's still in college. He's do, he's doing his school while he's fucking trading shit. The next to him is just buying mm -hmm. and flipping NFTs. So they'll he'll sit me up and he'll be like, yo, there's a new NFT drop and he'll buy them for fucking 0.08 ether and sell them for fucking eight ether, six ether, you know, two months later for how I have no fucking clue. And I learn shit here every day, literally every day. And I'm 38 and I sit here and I learn shit every day. It's ridiculous. It really is. And that, and that's something you guys will see if you, you know, for people who take the course too, is you get to know everybody who's in this class for your live session. You get to know the walks of life that they come from, people sharing their experience. And there's some legit traders who take this, you know, very experienced, very profitable traders who take this course because they're like, hey, dude, I want to learn take reading from, from Lucci. That'll help me, you know, in the long run. Right. Right. Just perspective next, on options or next, whatever. Next to the NFT guy, I got a fucking short activist who will literally fly to certain places just to see if a company is fucking legit and just to get the juice to go and come back here to the office to short the living shit out of these things. That's that's what happens here on a daily basis. And I look around and I'm just like, what the fuck? What like all you got to do is pick what game you want to play. There's so many games. There are so many games. There are so many profitable games. There are so many ways to make it. You know, I learn every single day and I learn new games every single day. Oh, yep. Uh, we got a question. Where is the office? The office is in Puerto Rico, guys. So if you're interested in that, you can check out Trade Space. Uh, just Google Trade Space Puerto Rico. It'll come up. A um, couple more minutes here. How far in your career did you realize that you had an edge in writing options and became more dedicated to that niche? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You guys know, like, like, it, like if you do something so consistently for such a long time, but you know there's one thing that you're, you see that you know there's value in, but you just can't get away from what you're doing currently to just pull yourself out of your own body and look at what you really, you know, believe there's potential in. And you just kind of avoid it for the longest time. That was me with options writing. I mean, I was in New York. We had a, we had a small hedge fund in New York and I was still doing my crazy shit. And the whole time I was doing it, I started to realize like, why the fuck am I not selling these options? I mean, if I'm going for the 20% or 30% of times where you buy an option and it, it goes 5X or it goes 4X and you can really make up for some losses that you have taken and you can really do some damage. That was always my strategy. Then why not 80% of the time just fucking write some shit? Just write some shit 80% of the time. What's the, why can't you do this? And every time it was brought up to me, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it for ego, stubborn, whatever reasons. Didn't want to do it. And then finally, we were in New York, and my boy uh, Rummy, Charlie, you remember Rummy? Rummy remember came. Rummy, Rummy, 
Yeah, Rami's one of my good friends. He, he came through and he was just, you know, he, he had a job in finance. He was selling data. He was selling data on Wall Street or something. And, and our office was on Wall Street. So he would just come through, you know, during lunch and shit. And he would just show me what he was up to. And I finally took a look at one of his strategies. And I was like, all right, fuck it. Just come here and then we'll trade together. I'll, I'll write some shit with you. And all of a sudden, like I started to, I started to just do it. I started to just do it. And then fast forward, fun blows up. Like I had to go back to, to, to Boston. I had to work myself back up, but in my head, I knew like, all right, if I'm going back up again, I'm going to take this writing options a, a lot more seriously. And I hit it again. I hit a couple million again. And I was like, all right, all I'm going to do now is just write options. And I had one year where I just made, I don't know, two, $3 million just writing options and just spending more of my time away from the markets. And I was like, this is the fucking, why the fuck wasn't I doing this, you know, 10 years ago, but we do that to us often, right? We say that to ourselves often. Your path is your path. You can't get upset at yourself for not doing something. You have to go through whatever you have to go through because information still has to work itself out in your brain. You have to make the connections. You got to, you got to, you got to, you got to make the emotional connections as well. Like there's a lot that has to go on before you can commit to something, anything, you know? So to answer that question about writing options, it took me a long time to realize the value. Now I do it all day, every fucking day. I do it all day, every day. And you know what? Ronchero, who is another educator that you guys are going to, uh, you guys are going to be taught uh, inside the master course. He's even, he's way better than me on this stuff. Um, you know, and he's, he's taken it to another level where he's built out a strategy that has factored in so many more things that I haven't factored in. And that's the beautiful thing about options and writing options is that you can hedge yourself on so many conditions and so many things. And it helps you stay alive. And that's the whole goal. You got to stay alive until your moment, until it's your fucking time to shine, you know? And that's the most important part. That's what I never realized for the longest time. I, I didn't know how to stay alive, you know? And um, yeah, so for writing options, it took me a long time, but now that I'm here, I can't imagine a world without it. I even write options for crypto now. So I have a, I have a fund uh, trading crypto now where I just write options. Now, of course, there are those times where shit goes haywire. You gotta have you gotta have plans for this, but it's possible. Right. It's a good strategy. Um, for everybody asking questions about the master course, go to go to sanglucci.com, use the help chat in the bottom right, send us an email at contact at sanglucci.com. You can set up a call with Spencer. A lot of you know Spencer, he's he's one of our guys, he'll answer a lot of your questions about this. Um but we'll get all your questions answered. It's, it's easier to do it um, that way than, than answer them all here. Uh, Luke, just do one more and then, and then we'll, we'll close this one down. Um, I mean, you're talking about keeping your seat at the table, right? You got to stay alive. How do you pull yourself out of a, mind, of, a, of a mental hole when things aren't going well for you? Yeah, I think there was a, there's, there's like three or four questions asking this same thing in just different ways. Like I, I see this one from Fernando here. Um, from someone who has gone through a lot of pain and is psychologically affected with the accumulation of massive losses from your professional trade, you know, trading point of view, what advice would you give? Um, you know, what was the initial question? My bad, Charlie, I forgot. Like it. basically, how do you, how do you pull yourself out of a hole? You're in a dark place. Like how do you pull yourself out? Of it? It's a tough thing, man. It's a tough thing. And it's, it's very different for everybody. And this is a question that I would direct back to Charlie because Charlie is the, Charlie, remember who Charlie is. Charlie is about to be Dr. Bathgate. You know what I mean? And this is, well, this is his be doctor, but I'll be, I'll have yeah. a master's. <laughs> yeah. You can call you me know, doctor if you want to, Char it just won't be academically correct. You know? so. And Charlie's watched his father, Charlie's watched his father go through all this shit, you know? So when, even when he was a kid, you know, he saw his father going through all this shit, you know what I mean? He probably still sees his father go through all, you know, a lot of this stuff too. So, Indeed. you know, this, I, I, I would throw this question back to Charlie at some point here, but um, it's different for everybody. The answer is it's, it's different for everybody. Some people are, some people respond to pain in a much different way than others. Me personally, I don't respond too well, man. I'm not going to lie, but I would say over the years, I respond so much better now. It's amazing how quickly I'm able to get back on my feet now versus, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 15 years ago, I would go in a freaking, you know, 
on a depression tirade here for, for months, sometimes even years, man. And then, because remember, all this is about confidence. All this is about confidence. This is about, it's about so many things coming together at the same time. You still have to make decisions. You still got to make sacrifices. You still got to deal with the money. Like, you don't, you, you don't have any money anymore. Maybe now you got to change your living situation. You got to change your relationships. You know, people around you are changed because of the things that you go through from a financial perspective. So there's so much that happens to a person on a, on a, on a drawdown in a, in a, you know, I think the better question and the, and the question that we should be talking about is what happens to somebody on that drawdown? You know, what happens to somebody's life on that drawdown? And you should showcase that, showcase some of those things. And that'll help people look at people's lives and how much they change from, you know, taking a big loss in, in, in the markets, not having a lot of cash anymore or not having anything anymore, you know, and then having to bounce back. What happens to a person's life when those things happen? You know, there's a lot of changes that happen, changes that change you and affect your, you know, affect your future. So there's no easy answer to this question. It really depends on who you are. Um, I would say the best way to go about it is to remember, always remember always remember and again this is in meditation and any spirituality discussions like yo you're still alive man you're still alive and if you still got a seat at the fucking table quit your bitching quit <laughs> your bitching and get the fuck back up get the fuck back up there's no other answer to this question it just depends on how long you want to beat yourself up before you come to the same realization because that's that's the same realization you're going to come to. So you can beat yourself up for three months. You can beat yourself up for a day. You can beat yourself up for two years. You're going to come to the same same conclusion. It's like, all right, what do I have to do now? So, how, you know, it really just depends on, <laughs> on how you want to go about it. And it'll take a couple times to do the wrong things first before you figure out how to do it the right way. But I kind of want to hear Charlie's answer to this question. I'm going to do the lamest thing ever and I'm going to punt because I'm going to punt to the, I'm going to punt to next week's conversation with Chris <laughs> Katie, because this is so he's, much of what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, he's good. And he's good. I mean, this is, this is the kind of thing like this, this is it. This is one of the core questions that you have to be able to answer. If you're you know providing education to people around trading, that's why we have like five classes in the master's course dedicated to trading psychology in this. And one of the reasons why we, we paired up with Chris because um, his experience, he's got, you know, I think like over 35 years of trading experience. That's crazy. He, for a while, he was he was uh, training new traders for Goldman Sachs um, and trading his own account with essentially limitless size. I mean, the guy the guy's background and experience is completely insane, and he can explain. I think he and I together play off uh, work work well together to to explain some of these 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 concepts. Every single time I do a webinar with Chris, I get like five to ten emails from people being like. That dude just changed my life. And like, I don't know what he, I don't know how he just encapsulated that, but that just changed my life. So that is a sh completely shameless plug for next week. Same time, 4.15 on Tuesday. The series continues with Chris Katie. We're going to get into these kind of questions um, and it'll be great. So continues from there. All righty. Luch, thanks for doing this, man. I appreciate it. We're going to bring you back on for the last interview in the series. So we're not, we're not done with you yet, but you got a couple weeks off. Um, everybody hopefully uh, hopefully see you there look forward to it and, and we'll see you next Tuesday with Chris All right. sounds good talk to you guys thanks for being here everybody see you guys